The title of the message this morning is Faith for More. We'll be at Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 21. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would give us just what the title of the message is, Faith for More this morning. Despite what closed door we've uh, come to or uh, the place potentially that we've come to in, in our lives, we're, we're realizing that we're not enough. Lord, I pray that you would uh, take up right there because you are more than enough. And so God, in that we ask, Lord, for faith for more today. Faith for more of what you have for us. Faith for more of what you have in store. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I remember the day very vividly. It was the day that I got my learner's permit. You see, I had gone, I had studied the book, I went to the DMV, I passed the test, and upon passing the test, I thought that the world was at my fingertips. It was at my fingertips and also someone who would sit in the seat opposite me uh, and help me learn how to drive. But you see, that day I was feeling so good, there was really nothing anyone could tell me. I was just ready to hit the open road. And so I got home uh, from passing the test and Uh, Living with my aunt and uncle at that time, my uncle handed me the keys to his truck and he said, are you ready to go to the store? Oh, you better believe I'm ready to go to the store. So we hop in the truck and one thing that had escaped me at that particular moment was that the truck had one of those transmissions called a manual transmission (laughs) that you had to shift. There was this thing called the clutch and they didn't have that in the book that I had studied about exactly how to do that. It was rules of the road. And so we got into the truck and he began to tell me how to drive a stick shift. Mind you, I'd never done so before. But even though he was telling me how to drive it, you see, I had just passed the test. So some of the things that he was saying were just kind of going in one ear and out the other. I was ready to hit the streets going. And so we started and he got me off of starting and starting was kind of an issue as we kind of clunked through the road. If you've ever driven a manual, you know what that's like. But then we got onto the road and everything was good until we came to a stop sign. We came to a stop sign and it was on just a subtle little incline And what I noticed was as soon as I let up on that clutch, what's happening, the the truck is is going a little bit backwards and uh, I'm a little bit turned around myself because I've never been in a situation like this. And so he's kind of saying, are are you ready to listen to me now? (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready to listen to you now. But you see, when I was at that stop sign, when I was in that place, it was a little too late. I should have listened to him when he was giving me the tips or, or even had uh, you know, enough understanding that I probably shouldn't hit the streets in this way. As cars are going through this four-way stop and the cars behind us are honking at us, wondering why a driver like that is on the road, lo and behold, one of our friends drives by and is pointing and laughing as I'm trying to get through this particular stop sign. And ultimately we made it through. And so I was so focused on that, I nearly hit several cars on my right-hand side. We made it to the hardware store. And when we got to the hardware store, he says, did you learn anything? I learned that TriMet's not so bad after all. (laughs) That maybe TriMet is the place for me. Maybe I was just destined to be uh, someone who rides the bus. And it was at that particular point that I'm telling you the truth. I almost said, I'm done with driving. You see, what was happening was I wasn't drawing from the one. I wasn't willing to continually hear what he had to see as I was going down that street. And because of that, I found myself in defeat. As we pick up in Matthew chapter 17, we find the disciples in a place of defeat. They had been given the power in Matthew chapter 10 to go about and and heal and preach and teach and cast out evil spirits. Yet here in Matthew 17, they're not able to do so. The ultimate reason is because they weren't continually drawing from the source that they needed to draw through. And at that point that they had come to, when they come to this particular stop, it's a little bit too late at that point. And so Jesus points them to the most important thing that they would need to know. You see, he's about six months before he was going to go to the cross, uh, sacrifice his own life in place of ours and theirs. And the most important thing that they would understand was faith. 
And so Jesus wanted to point them toward more, faith for more in their life. And I trust it will be an encouragement to you this morning as well. If you would, please open with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, and we're gonna read verses 14 to 21. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and he's very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? He said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. The man in this story had brought his son who's possessed with an evil spirit, possessed with a a, a demon to the disciples in order for his son to be healed so that the disciples could cast that out. But the disciples find themselves perplexed and puzzled by the outcome. The place to which they had come, whatever was plaguing the man's son was more than they could manage. It was more than they had come up against. Jesus, as I mentioned, had previously given them the authority, but at this particular point, their efforts fall flat. Their faith, it faltered. Faith, we know, means a belief, a trust in God, taking him at his word and responding to that faith. It seems to be the last thing, however, on the disciples' minds. He uses, however, Jesus does, their lack of faith as an opportunity to show them their inability was not a closed door, but an opportunity for him to point them toward faith for more. You and I in our lives, we find ourselves puzzled, perplexed at some of the situations that we come up against. Why are things going the way that they're going? Why am I up against what I'm up against? Why are things not working out the way that I would like them to? And we find ourselves overwhelmed by the weight of that rather than keeping our focus fixed on faith in Jesus. Jesus had shown the disciples time and time again, no matter what situation would come, there was hope in his hands. And for you this morning, no matter what you're facing, no matter what puzzle you're trying to put together, Jesus has given more more than enough to show you that there's hope in his hands. If you're facing a closed door, he has more in store. And I encourage you to have faith as well in Jesus for more. And no matter what you're currently carrying or up against, bring it all before Jesus. Bring it all before Jesus. Bring that perplexion, bring that puzzle, bring that closed door to Jesus. What do we see here in verse 15? This man comes to Jesus and we understand that the disciples were there. The disciples had tried to heal his son. The crowd came up and this man comes to Jesus on his knees saying, Lord, have mercy on my son for he is a lunatic. He is very ill. He often falls into the fire. He falls into the water and I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. I brought him to your disciples, the people who were out preaching and teaching and ministering in your name, and they could not help him. I'm asking you, Lord, for mercy. I'm asking you, Lord, for your help. I want you to understand the term there. It says, for he is a lunatic. That word lunatic actually uh, depicts someone who in that day, they believed if someone stared at the moon too long, luna, Moon, they believe someone stared at the moon too long, they would become a lunatic or moonstruck. They would be glossed over by looking at the moon. And so there was this ancient belief that madness was caused by the influence of the moon. So he says, my son is a lunatic. And so 
It was actually a technical term in their day. Someone could technically be a lunatic. Now we use the term obviously differently. When we come to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on me, my child's a lunatic, we mean something different. (laughs) Anyhow, the man's son is possessed with a spirit. The man's son is possessed with a spirit. And what we know from Mark chapter nine is that whenever that spirit seizes his son, It slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He stiffens out. He says, I told your disciples, I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were unable. His affliction was the the, the, um, result of an evil spirit that was in him. This man's son was falling into the water, throwing himself into the fire in an attempt to end his life. Throw, when they came near water, throw himself in, stiffen out, and they'd have to go pick him up out of the water. You imagine what this father's life was like with a son who is plagued by this. And this is the way that that evil spirit was revealing itself in the son's life. And the son's throwing himself here and there, and the man is struggling his son very ill, his condition more than psychological, more than mental, it was spiritual his condition spiritual and the father's desire was for healing for his son. And so where does he go? He goes to the disciples. We read actually in Matthew 10 verses one to two, that, that, that place where Jesus had given his disciples authority. It says, Jesus summoned his disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease every kind of sickness. We also know that what this man was asking the disciples to do was something that they had already done. In Mark 6, 12 to 13, they went out, preached that men should repent and they were casting out many demons. They were anointing with oil, many sick people and healing them. So the father brings his heavily afflicted son to them. However, they are unsuccessful. And so as Jesus approached the crowd, this man runs to him. He kneels down before him and he says, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I brought my son to your disciples and they were unable to help. They could not cure him, verse 16 says. And seeing the scene and hearing what the man had to say, understanding the authority that he had given to his disciples and the fact that in that moment, they were unable to appropriate it by faith. Jesus responds to his disciples, to the generation, and then to the man. What does he say? Jesus said in verse 17, you unbelieving and perverted generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him at once. Jesus rebuked that evil spirit. And Jesus is here circling the lack of faith of the disciples. He speaks to the crowd. He speaks to the disciples and he speaks to their lack of faith that they were unbelieving. And that term uh, perverted, that means something today that what he's referring to here was something differently. He's talking about spiritual perversion. That word uh, perverted in the Greek, uh, diastrepho, which means to be bent or twisted in the wrong direction, to be oriented toward the wrong thing. And he's talking about a spiritual perversion that plagued their day. People were oriented in the wrong direction. And some of you may think, well, that sounds familiar We know that we too live in a generation that is often plagued by unbelief. Jesus is calling that out. Jesus puts his finger on the problem and the disciples are staying there and Jesus puts his finger right on the problem. And in our lives as well, Jesus does that, doesn't he? He puts his finger right on the problem. And we always like it when Jesus puts his finger on someone else's problem. But when Jesus comes and he puts his finger on our problem, we're like, oh, thanks, Jesus, single me out, you know, but, but Jesus needed to call this out because the foundation upon which the disciples needed to be built was what? Faith. 
I'm gonna ask that question again. The foundation, I gotta set you up for that. Faith is the foundation. The foundation upon which the disciples needed to be built was what? Faith. They needed faith and trust in him because he was six months away. He was six months away from uh, his death, burial, resurrection. They needed faith and trust in him and in who he was. But when we get uh, the finger pointed at us, the focal point, when it becomes centered on the things that we are not, the place that we're lacking, the place that we're looking to is not the right place. That never feels good. When I was in high school, uh, I, I made the team my sophomore year. And I made the basketball team. And so I was out there playing on the basketball team and I didn't get a lot of minutes on the basketball team. But you see, one really interesting thing was that in our league, there was a, a school. So I went to a lower high school, go Warriors. But there was a school in our league called Jesuit. And yeah, boo, I know, right? What's up with Jesuit? Anyway, Jesuit at that time had an absolute a uh, stud basketball player on their team. His name was uh, Michael Dunleavy. And he ended up going to play Duke. He ended up going to play in the NBA. He would always light us up for like 50 points. Anyway, Michael Dunleavy's dad was the coach of the Portland Trailblazers. And so we're playing Jesuit. And I get in the game and coach Dunleavy from the Blazers is over there on the bench. And I felt like I needed to show coach Dunleavy, you know, my game a little bit. <laughs> And so we're going up and down the floor. The coach finally puts me in, you know, like I, I had to really cherish the time that I got in there. And so he threw me in there. And so I'm going in and I'm playing the game and I'm trying to make something happen. You know, like we're getting blown out by these guys. I got to get in there and make something happen. And three times down the floor, I'm just, I, I don't even know what I was doing. I was just running around trying to make stuff happen. Now, we had spent a lot of time uh, in tryouts and through practice learning the plays that we were supposed to run. But three times down the floor, I didn't run the plays. I'm like, someone's got to do something here. It might as well be me. I got to show Coach Dunleavy a few things. And I go three times down the floor. Well, guess what happens? The coach pulls me out, singles me out, and says, you didn't run the plays three times down the floor. So the rest of the game, Coach Dunleavy didn't get to see my talents. I think that, you know, really speaks to the way things turned out in my life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But you see, the coach had a plan and Jesus has a plan and Jesus knows the importance of faith. And so Jesus is trying to draw out that faith in his disciples. And so he says, you're turned in the wrong way. You're focused on yourself. You're, you're, you're focused on the things that, that you can do, the things that man can do. You're oriented in the wrong direction. And sometimes in the things that we pursue, I would say a lot of times in the things that we pursue, we're oriented in the wrong direction. We're walking by sight, not by faith, even though we know the scripture says walk by faith and not by sight. And so Jesus is saying, you're oriented in the wrong direction. You've seen it all. Now focus on faith. And so after addressing the generation, after addressing the disciples, here's the words and we gotta catch it. Jesus says, bring them here to me. He says, your disciples weren't able. Clearly in this man's life, his young son, everything that they had tried, nothing had worked. No one had been able no one had been able to source the solution for this young boy. The young boy was plagued. Their family was filled with difficulty. They were up against a spiritual battle. And while maybe not to this degree, we know that in our day and in our time and the things that we face, we too are up against a spiritual battle. And we know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we know that there's some things going on there's, there's, there's the enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy your life, your family, your marriage, your children, to draw them in the place where they think that, 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 that they've no hope. They're throwing themselves into the fire. They're throwing themselves into the water and they're drowning. And what we need to hear is Jesus' words when he says what? Bring him here to me. And that needs to be true in our lives as well, that we would bring our children, that we would bring our marriages, that we would bring our difficulty, that we would bring what we're up against, where? To Jesus. Jesus says, bring him here to me. He had tried others, but nothing they did 
mattered. Nothing they did changed anything. And often we're looking for the helping hand of another, but what we need to do is bring our burden, bring our cares upon the Lord. There are the exact words Jesus says here are what we need. Don't bring your burdens to the place that they shouldn't be. Don't bring your burdens to the place that you think they should be. No, bring your burdens to Jesus. Regarding the the burdens that we face, Jesus says, bring them here to me. You have a child that's headed towards whatever, lunacy, bring him to Jesus. Bring him to Jesus. Regarding the unbelief, regarding the perversion in our day spiritually, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to him because he is the one who can do something about it. He is the one who can transform. He is the one who is the solution to every lie. Bring it all to Jesus. Pray continually. If you have a a child that's headed in the wrong direction, bring them to Jesus. Keep pointing them toward Jesus. Keep bringing them to church. Keep surrounding them with Jesus. Keep pointing them to the place that you know that they should be. Jesus says, bring them to me. Bring them to me so that maybe even if right now they don't have eyes to see, one day they may. That That your children, that your family, that they can see you running the race. Bring them to Jesus. And sometimes people say, oh, well, I tried the church thing. I brought my kid to youth group and, you know, they weren't really into it. Keep bringing them. Keep bringing them. Well, you know, I brought them to church on Sunday and, you know, they kind of slouched down and they weren't really into it. It's just not their thing. Okay, how is it ever going to be if we don't bring them before Jesus and the place where they can hear about Jesus and the place where they can be surrounded by the love of Christ and the love of Jesus? Keep bringing them. You say, man, gosh, you're really pressing on this. How do you know this is so important? I know this is so important because I lived it. We, we weren't in, we weren't in, in my, 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 the, the enemy was trying to kill, steal, and destroy my family. I mean, you see, like, you see this, like our family today, we have three other siblings that would, could be up here with us praising Jesus and they all are. You think the enemy wanted that? You think the enemy wanted this? No. And so the enemy's wreaking havoc on our family. And I remember from the time, I think I was like four until the time that I was like 14, man, we weren't, we, I, I, don't, I told you, I didn't really grow up in the church, you know? We would go every once in a while. Before I was four, my parents were heavily involved. But here's the deal. When I was 14, uh, when, I was, when I was 14, 13, I moved back in with my dad. Eighth and ninth grade, eighth grade, we weren't going to church. Ninth grade, something happened and the Lord began to, to, to open up his heart. And so he started taking me to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Every week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He made me throw away my CDs. Oh yes, he did. And I would come to the church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, And if you looked at me in that church, you'd be like, man, this kid's not into it. I remember being in youth group and they ask, who has a heart for ministry? Who wants to serve the Lord in ministry? And I'm like, not me. I don't wanna do that. But you see, the Lord had other plans. And so my dad that year, he kept bringing me to Jesus. And then I move in with my aunt and uncle and my aunt's on staff at the church. And my uncle, he was one of the the, the preachers who would preach occasionally in the church. And my being surrounded by the church only began to increase. And I remember being, uh, saying to myself after a couple weeks of going to the church, being like, man, this isn't for me, but here's the deal. It was exactly the place that the Lord needed me to be so that he could move upon my heart. And we have to understand that. We have to understand that we can't restrict, we can't, we, can't, uh, we can't restrict or coil back or turn away. The place that the Lord wants us to be is before him. The place that the Lord wants your family to be is before him. The place that the Lord wants your kids to be is before him. And I think about in my life, those things where I go, I go, man, like, like, 
I was thinking about this the other day. <laughs> it's not even funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. I was thinking about this the other day, that the times in my, there, there were times in my life where certain things were allowed by an authority in my life. And I look back on it and I go, why did they let me do that? Why did they give me the, the green light for that? Why didn't they fight? Why didn't they fight? Why'd they let go? And I look back on that and by the grace of God, right? He, he works all things together for good. And we see that here, even in this story. But I'm just telling you, and I'm encouraging you this morning, don't give up don't give up. Because my dad could have looked at me and been like, man, he does not not want to be here. Let's go watch football or something. And I would have enjoyed that. I would have been hooping and hollering, but the Lord didn't want me hooping and hollering for the, the football. He wanted me hooping and hollering for him. He wanted me living for him. And so I'm just telling you, orient your family, orient your life around him. Bring him to Jesus. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, bring them to Jesus. What did the man do when the disciples could do nothing? He didn't stop. He wasn't detoured. He didn't move in a different direction. No, he got all the way there. Bring them all to Jesus. And here's what we know, Philippians 1, 6, that when God begins a good work, he is faithful to complete it. And so don't get in the way of that. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete. He will be faithful to complete the good work that he started. I don't see a whole lot of good right now. Let God complete it because you don't know what good is until you know what God's goodness is. You wanna see God's goodness? Bring them to Jesus. It was the key to victory. And we have to have that key as well. Have have faith that he is able, having faith that he is able in our lives, in our families, in our situation to do more than anyone has ever done, more than we're able to do, more than our best efforts could ever do. He is able, have faith that he is able, have faith in him, trust in him, believe in him, stand on him. After verse 17, here's what the man says to Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you can do anything, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can do anything. And Jesus says this, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And what it seems to me is that Jesus is saying, you're asking me if I can do anything. I'm asking you if you can do this one thing. Can you believe? I can do all things. Nothing's impossible to him who believes. Can you do that one thing? I can do all things. Can you do that one thing in your life? Can you do that one thing? Believe him and trust him. And here's what the man says. I do believe. Help my unbelief. And, and, and you know what? I appreciate that answer. Because I think that many of us can relate to that. I, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. And Lord, I'm asking you for more, but I know that I need so much more. And so help me in my unbelief. And what did he do right then and there? He healed the man's son. Help me in my unbelief. Lord, is there, is there a place in your family, in your life where you're, you're struggling to believe, you're struggling to see? Lord, help me in my unbelief. I believe, will you help me? Will you help me to walk by faith and not by sight? That would not only be a lesson for the father, that would be a lesson for his disciples. Because what we see is as the, the situation changes, the disciples go to Jesus privately. And what do they say? They say, why could we not drive it out? Why couldn't we do this? You see, we've done this before. We had a formula, we did this, it works. It works, but it didn't work here. Why couldn't we drive it out? And Jesus responds quick, because of the littleness of your faith. Because you did not believe because you did not believe, because you did not rely on faith in me. The disciples had been given that authority. We talked about that. But we also have to understand that there are many things that we wanna see. There are many things that the Lord wants to do, even in our day, but the object of our prayers have to be our faith. What did they say? I think the key is in what they said. They said, Lord, why were we not able to cast it out? They needed to be focused on he, not we. And we need to be focused on he, not we. He is the object of our faith. He is the one that we come to. It's his 
It's faith in him, not just faith in faith, not just faith in self. No, it's faith in Jesus. It continually has to be he, not we. And he points them to their lack of faith. And we see that in and throughout Jesus' ministry. In fact, we see when a synagogue official named Jairus comes to Jesus. And he comes and he says, my, my daughter is near death. Would you come? Would you come and lay hands on her? Would you come and touch her so that she can be healed? And so Jesus goes. Now, while he's on his way, there's some interruption. There's a woman who comes. She needs healing. He stops. He's looking for her. There's a delay in the time. And at the end of that time of ministry with the woman, there's some men who come from the synagogue official's house and they say to the synagogue official, Jairus, they say, your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Don't bother the teacher anymore. You know what Jesus said to him? He said, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. You think your child's dead? Don't be afraid, just believe. You think it's all over? Don't be afraid, just believe. You have to have faith that he is able. You think your marriage is over? Don't be afraid, just believe. Trust in Jesus, let him lead. And what did he do? He went to the house and he walked in to the house and there were the wailers wailing and the criers crying. They were professionals. They actually had that back then, professional wailers to make you feel good about your grief. Anyhow, they're in there, the wailers wailing, the criers crying. Jesus says, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And they start laughing at him. Jesus moves out the mockers. When the mockers moved out, he healed her. You might need to move out some mockers in your life. Some people who are coming against what the Lord wants to do, telling you that it can't be done. These people coming from the house saying, she's dead. These people saying your marriage, it's dead, it's over. No, that's not what Jesus says. He says, don't be afraid, only believe. And so when you bring that to Jesus, you have faith that he is able, that he is able to do what only he can do in your life. Here's the deal. In Matthew chapter 13, 58, we know that Jesus went back to Nazareth. It says he did not do many miracles there. You wanna know why? Was it because of their sin? No. Was it because he was tired? No. It's because they didn't believe. It's because they didn't believe. So we gotta believe that God is able and we have to trust him in that faith. The Bible's filled with it. The Bible is filled with it. It was faith that caused Caleb and Joshua to go into the land of Canaan and see giants and say, this is a land that God could give us, but the others didn't believe. It was faith in God's care that caused Job to to, to say these words, though he slay me, I will hope in him. It matters not what's happening. Faith in God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could stand at the edge of a fiery furnace and say to the king, our God will deliver, but even if he doesn't, I'm not gonna bow down to you. I'm not gonna bow down to you and God delivered. It was faith in God that Daniel had when they said, stop praying, stop seeking. And he did not stop. And he was thrown into a den of hungry lions and he was spared in that. (laughs) They had faith that he would be able. And Jesus continues to circle this for the disciples. He told them in Matthew 6, have faith that he is able to provide for your needs, that he is able to provide clothing and food. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough trouble of its own. He talked to them regarding their faith in the middle of a storm while he was sleeping. Why did you doubt? Regarding Peter's fear of falling while he was walking on water and their concern about not having enough bread when they're on this trip with Jesus, even though they had seen him feed 5,000 and 4,000 plus women and children. Now they're on a trip with Jesus and they say, we don't have enough bread. And Jesus says, will you stop talking about bread? Sorry, he didn't say it that way, but you, you, you get the idea. I can provide bread. I can do this. I'm the healer. Will you have faith in me? Just have faith in me. Faith is not what we bring to the table, but we also know Hebrews 11, six, that without faith, it's impossible to do what? It's impossible to please him. For he who comes to him must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And I'm convinced that that there are things in our lives that, that we're not coming to the Lord, bringing those needs before him, 
What does the scripture say? You, you have not because you ask not. I believe that there are things that the Lord's just waiting for us to go to him, believing with faith, and he wants to give those good gifts to us. Roman, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, one to two, let us run the race with endurance that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. What was going on with these disciples is that they were not staying connected to the source and we have to stay connected to the source. When we're up here on worship team, we have these little boxes, these little boxes here. I don't know if you can see it, but you see these blue, oh, here's a higher one. We have these blue boxes here. And this is like, you know, when I was coming up, we had these floor monitors, but now we don't. We have these little boxes. And so we have to plug in here and then we all have these little connections on our belt. We have to plug in those connections. Then we have these headphones and that's how we hear everything up here. And there have been so many times where I've come up here to lead worship and I'm like, I don't hear anything. Something's broken. Something's not working. And the sound people are like scrambling, like, oh no. You can't hear anything. And so we're trying to figure out cables back here. We're trying to do the, the whole thing. And lo and behold, someone will come up to me and they'll say, Samuel, you're not plugged in. You're not plugged in right here. I'm like, well, I was just testing you guys. <laughs> but catch this. I mean, there's things that we're not seeing. There's things that we're not believing for. There's things that we're not trusting the Lord for. And we're coming up into a stop sign and we're going backwards, not forwards. Why? Because we're not connected to the source. We have to stay connected to the source, to walk by faith, not by, by sight. To know Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus reminded us in John 15.5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, I in him bears what? Much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And we also know Ephesians 3.20, it's him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far above all that we could ask or even think but we come to the stop sign. And if we're not connected to the source, we're gonna go backwards, not forwards. In Joshua 6, we see the Israelites come to this territory. It was a, a, a territory, a city with inconquerable walls, Jericho. And then we see a, a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus come and visit Joshua. He gives him the plan of attack. What was the plan of attack? I want you to go walk around the city once per day for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. This was the plan that he had given to Joshua. Now he gives the plan to Joshua and then he says to Joshua, and then those walls are gonna fall flat. But when Joshua gives the plan to the people, he doesn't say that the walls are gonna fall flat. He just says, this is what we're gonna do. And so these guys are walking around these walls for six days and seven times on the seventh day. And after the seventh time on the seventh day, the walls were gonna fall flat. But what were they walking around up to that? They were walking next to these big, huge walls. And maybe you feel like you're circling these big, huge walls in your life. And the, each time that you go around, all they look to you is bigger and harder and more difficult and more inconquerable. But here's the deal. Had the Israelites stopped on day six, They wouldn't have seen what the Lord wanted to do. You can't stop on day six. Go all the way, trust, walk by faith and not by sight. You say, man, nothing's happening. Can you picture that with me for a moment? Nothing's happening. Can you imagine that these were the men of war who were going out circling the city of Jericho and then they go back to their house and their wife's at home. How'd it go today? Well, we walked around the walls. Day two, how'd it go today? Anything happen? Nope. Day three, don't ask. <laughs> day four, day five, anything, nothing. Day six, day seven, one, two, three, and maybe you feel that way in your life. Anything happening? Boy, keep walking. Keep walking. Keep pursuing. Keep following the Lord. Keep trusting him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
not on your own understanding, because in our own understanding, all we see is inconquerable walls. In his own understanding, all this dad would see is inconquerable walls. Same with the disciples. But what does Jesus say? He says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What do we need to do? We need to keep seeking the Savior. Trust that he is able, have faith in him, keep seeking the Savior because even uh, faith the size of a mustard seed can do great things. And we understand that that mustard seed, we looked at that, that's a growing faith. That mustard seed is a growing faith, but you see it starts small. And the picture here that we get is not this great faith in a small God. No, we're talking about faith in the great God. I need faith in him. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And as we go, we grow so that we can grow through what we go through. We know that it's the smallest seed, the mustard seed, yet when it grows, it's the largest of all the garden plants. It becomes a tree. And Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain from here to there. Nothing will be impossible to you. So why isn't Mount Hood in my view? I want Mount Hood. I want a view of my house of Mount Hood. But Jesus isn't talking about that there. We've never, in history, Jesus never moved a mountain from here. He's not talking about Mount Hood going into the Columbia River. What he's talking about is great obstacles. The great obstacles that we face. And that was a figure of speech that was used actually in their day. That you could, someone who could overcome great obstacles was a person who could move mountains. Jesus is talking about that great faith, the things that we come up against, the walls, the difficulties, the stop signs, the closed doors. And in verse 21, Jesus indicates something that I think is really also important for us to catch. In the book of Mark, uh, we see that he says, this kind only comes out by prayer. Here we say, here he says, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Interestingly, Jesus didn't pray here. He didn't stop for a time of prayer. He didn't stop for a time of fasting. And so what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about a life of prayer and fasting, a life that seeks the Lord, a life that knows that, yeah, there's stuff that's gonna come, but I'm staying connected to the source. I want faith for more in my life. And so I'm gonna stay connected to the source because it was something about this particular affliction. Jesus says, this kind is only gonna go out by prayer and fasting. God works all all things together for good, amen? But there are things in our lives that will only come out, only be drawn out, only be pushed over by prayer and fasting. And so we're talking about your family, we're talking about your children, we're talking about those obstacles, pray and fast and pray and fast and have a life of prayer and fasting. Because sometimes we think, oh, well, there's an emergency Well, what I'm reading here is that the emergency, when it's time for the emergency, it might be too late. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the rulers, authorities, the powers of the dark, against the spiritual forces of evil. There's a bigger battle going on. And so what we need to do is we need to fight that bigger battle with our God who is bigger and greater than it all. Amen? Amen. That's what we need. Now, I just wanna, as we close up this morning, I just want you to catch this with me because I look at this situation and there's always a a context to situations that happen. And so the disciples are down, nine of them are down. And basically because of Jesus' popularity, everyone knew what the disciples were, were doing, that they could heal, that they could cast out demons. And so what we see here is Uh, the disciples, nine of them are down. This man brings his son who's afflicted. They're unable to do it. And what starts happening? Arguing starts happening. The scribes come, they start arguing with them, probably something surrounding miracles or whatever. The crowd's up in a stir. Where was Jesus, Peter, James, and John? They were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They were up in glory. But what the other nine were experiencing was a different story. And so I don't know this to be true, but as I read this scripture, I put myself in their shoes. 
And you have these other guys who are up in glory, man. They're with Moses, they're with Elijah, they're with Jesus, like they're seeing him radiate. And for these other guys, they're having a different story down below. Why weren't they praying? Why weren't they fasting? Why weren't they seeking the Lord? And if it were me, if I put myself in their shoes, I think one of the things that I would struggle with in that moment was that feeling like everyone else is getting the glory. And I'm stuck down here, surrounded by lunatics, arguments, difficulties, struggles. Man, what am I? Second rate? What am I? You never take me up for the glory. I never get to go see Moses and Elijah. I never get to go do those things. And in our lives, we start to do the same. I'm not being used. I'm not being blessed. Look at everyone else. And what do we do over time? We start to turn away from the Lord, turn away from our times of seeking, turn away from our times of prayer and fasting because things are going different than we think that they should be going. And if you're not careful, you stop persisting in prayer. If you're not careful, you stop seeking the Lord and you come away and you uh, close the door to the Lord and you open the door to the world that you are surrounded by. But what does Jesus say? He says, this kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. That means that there are hurdles, there are battles that we need to know will only go out by prayer and fasting. And so for you this morning, if you're in that place, you've, you, you've turned away. You've gone in a different direction. I have a question for you that Paul asks in Galatians 5, 7. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Because the truth is, is that we need him every hour. The truth is that we need faith for more. The truth is that he has great plans. The truth is that he works all things out for good. You say, man, I don't see a whole lot of good. But think about this. This man in this story, his son is unable, they're unable to heal the man's son. And so what happens? The man brings him to Jesus. Jesus gives this encouragement and faith to his disciples and for you and for me today. Had that not happened in that day, we wouldn't have this scripture right here. We think, man, the disciples had it (laughs) and we don't. No, they faced it as well. And so we have to draw to the same place that they were drawn to. We have to keep seeking. We have to keep asking. We have to keep knocking. We have to have faith for more. And you say, man, I don't see it yet. But the Lord says, do you believe it yet? Will you do that one thing? Will you believe in me? Will you believe that I am able? Will you believe that I can do more? Will you believe that I have more in store? And so what I'm telling you this morning is that we have to draw near to him, knowing that he's gonna draw near to us and we draw near to him by faith. Lord, I know that you have more than my present situation. And I believe that there's just some people this morning that need to hear that. There's more than your present situation. God's gonna work it out in the way that 